this is a very, very special uh, tradition that we, we have. You know, traditions are not meant to be kept without meaning and, and, and significance. Right? This is a special tradition. And every Christmas, uh, the weeks leading up to Christmas, we light what we call the Christmas candles. There are four candles here, and each one represents what Christmas is all about. Okay, at, at this is what Christmas, how do we celebrate Christmas? And Christmas is special. Okay, and, and so we light the Christmas candle. So we need the lights out, uh, as the usual. <laughs> then the effect would be wonderful. Okay, and to, all right, someone open the door. Uh, we need the lights out, so could you shut the door too? Yeah, the hair cue. Okay, Henry. Okay, all right, good. So you need that, well, that, yeah, darkness. <coughs> yeah, can you switch on the backlight too? Okay, thank you. Okay, then, then the effects, then you look at the whole, and then it begins to understand. See, sometimes it's hard to understand a concept. The, the Bible uses a lot of visuals. Sometimes it uses the word see, taste that the Lord is good. How do you taste them? You can't taste it. How do you see the glory of the Lord? And so, very often we use visual to help us to understand a concept, like light. And the first candle we light, we call the prophecy candle. What is prophecy? Prophecy is that light in darkness, where there is uncertainty, where there is, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. And we live in a time with much uncertainty of war, of economic, and all kinds. We don't even know what's going to happen. It was that time where God would give a word of prophecy. And it's light. And so that prophecy was given. That God will send to us a Messiah who will be king. He will be that son. He will be that redeemer for the sins of the world. And that is a glorious prophecy that was fulfilled. The second candle we light is, we call this the Bethlehem candle. And it was prophesied that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. They knew this, but the problem was whether they believed in it. They did not go and search for the Christ. So we can have knowledge of God's Word, but we don't believe in it. And so the Bethlehem candle reminds us that we need to exercise faith in the Word of God. The third candle we light, and is today, is called the shepherd's candle. Humble shepherds were in the field on the night Christ was born. Poor as they were, they didn't have very much, labored hard. What, did, what does the shepherd's candle remind us of? God, one, he doesn't forget people. And that word, that light can come into their life. The angels brought that message. And they ch that changed their life forever. So the shepherd's candle reminds us of how the word of God, when we exercise faith in it, would change our life in the most wonderful way. Many people think often that if my circumstance would be better, my life would change. If I make more money, my life would change. If I get married, my life would change. By the way, if you do get married, your life will change. But inside, it could remain the same. The shepherd's circumstance did not change. They went on to become shepherds still. But you know what? Inside, that joy came, that life came, that hope was ignited, and there life was changed. And so we thank God for His Word. That is light. Apply faith. It will change that life in the most wonderful way. And this is what Christmas is all about. 
we go back to the Word of God and we are looking at how God's Word can touch lives and bless hearts. And we're going to hear three young ladies and they're going to share with us how the Word of God touched their lives, okay? Well, let's switch on the lights. I'm going to hand this time over to uh, the three uh, young ladies and they're going to share with us what they have experienced at the youth conference this year, okay? All right, Ta oh, Tamara, <laughs> Joanne and Melanie. Good morning, everyone. My name's Melanie, this is Tamara, and this is Joanne. And the three of us feel so privileged to be given this opportunity to share with all of you this morning. Last week, a small group of us, all three of us, and um, Amber and Matt, flew over to Singapore to attend Bethany's youth conference entitled Same Spirit of Faith. And we have a photo of us over there. Yeah, that's us on Sunday. And at this youth conference, each day was a really busy, but it was a very meaningful day where we participated in morning devotions, evening sessions, Bible study classes, games, times for worship and praise, and fellowship over many scrumptious meals. All of us fitted in very well over there and have a lot to take home from this camp. Each night, Pastor Charlie took the evening session and here he taught us and gave us a glimpse of what this spirit of faith is. However, at this camp, he taught a little bit differently. He taught in a way where he shared with us each night different stories of people who believed in God and spoke of the Lord, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. These stories were used to show us what this faith is all about and how this faith can change your life. One example that Pastor Charlie shared that really stood out to me was about a man named George Muller. He was an amazing man of faith and he actually looked over after over 1,700 orphans in Bristol, England. But he operated this orphanage literally through his faith in God and through prayer. And there were even times when all he had was his faith and there was no food or anything and he just prayed and trusted in God that he would provide. George Mueller's definition or understanding of faith was that faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. That's not faith, he says. He says, if things happened in the realm of possibility, God would get no glory. Faith begins when man's power has ended. It's really easy to think that, oh, George Mueller must have grown up as a good Christian little boy. But really, he was a 10-year-old thief, a wicked and mischievous boy, and he turned out to be a drunk and a gambler. How could someone like this change to be a faithful man of God? It really does sound impossible. But faith is believing that God can do the impossible, that he can change a person for the better. As it says in Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And God can change our lives. And when he does this work, we become his workmanship, a masterpiece. After hearing this word and seeing how God changed George Mueller's life, that he may become useful for God, it is now my challenge to continue to seek the Lord wholeheartedly, that his word will not just impact my mind, but my heart and soul as well. Knowing that God fulfills all that he promises, no matter how impossible they may seem, has caused me to look forward even more to Christmas with a heart of thanksgiving and joy renewed to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus, who made it all possible for our lives to be changed and to become his workmanship. Our first song this morning is O Little Town of Bethlehem. And it sings in the third verse, No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. And it is when Christ enters our heart that our lives can be transformed just like George Mueller's life was. 
So I'd like to invite you all to sing our first hymn this morning, O Little Town of Bethlehem, number 141. Thank you for your singing. Well, as Melanie mentioned, um, the week before last week, we had the wonderful opportunity to go to a youth conference at Bethany. I came away from camp with my heart and faith really encouraged and inspired. It was a wonderful time of learning lessons from the Word of God on the theme of the same spirit of faith, taken from 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13, which reads, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Just as this verse says, not only did I learn lessons through the Bible lessons, the messages about this same spirit of faith, but I observed it through the camp offices, the Bible study teachers and Vespers leaders and saw how they believed and spoke about their faith in Jesus. So this morning, I would like to take the time to share with you the things that I saw at youth conference. What inspired me at camp was the chairing. The student pastors and camp officers that chaired before each session shared their testimonies and spoke with such love and conviction and confidence in the Lord Jesus. And this really stood out to me and impacted my heart. Because the manner in which they spoke was so confident and words seemed to flow seamlessly from their heart. And later, I asked one of the student pastors and found out that they had actually spent three months in advance preparing and constantly refining the words they would say. And I was so touched by this special effort put in to communicate to the young people, to bring across how important and precious this faith in Jesus is, and how the Lord Jesus personally touched each of their lives. At camp, I was also really encouraged by the Bible study sessions. The three of us had the joy of being taught by a wonderful teacher, Teacher Jane, also known as Dr. Jane. And we have a photo of our Bible study group. Um, so to introduce you to Teacher Jane, um, for those of you who don't know who she is, Teacher Jane, or Dr. Dr. Jane, is a skillful, well-respected, well and sought-after surgeon. And so I guess you could see why I was so nervous at first to find out that she was going to be my Bible study teacher. Before youth conference started, I never really had the chance to speak to her before. And so to be taught by her all of a sudden uh, felt really intimidating and overwhelming. Teacher Jane, being a surgeon, I thought perhaps she would dissect me open, metaphorically of course, um, and examine every part of me. But of course, to my delight, she did not dissect me open. But instead, she taught lessons um, with enthusiasm and zeal for the Lord, lessons that really cut straight to my heart. Because before camp, I was feeling very troubled. Um, looking back at the year of 2017, which is now quickly coming to an end, I had faced so many struggles and obstacles throughout the year. I could feel myself with every struggle and obstacle getting more and more tired and slowly the motivation and the joy would fade. And I just really wanted this year to end. Somehow thinking that, you know, just because the year rolls over to a brand new year, everything like my stamina, my strength, my motivation would magically reset as well. And I felt so disappointed in myself for being so easily discouraged by setbacks and struggles. But through Teacher Jane's lessons, I was deeply encouraged by the example of Abraham. Though he is known as the great father of faith, in his initial years of his faith journey, even he struggled a lot. But the main thing is, 
And every time he, stu he stumbled and struggled, he came back to God. He chose faith and chose to rely on God. And it is that spirit of faith that I truly desire to have. A faith that is able to withstand failures and hold on to the promises of God. The main takeaway point for me is the challenge to grow this faith and to seek the same spirit of faith as Abraham, as the student pastors at camp, as the camp officers, who pressed on with their faith through their own individual struggles. From an easily discouraged faith to a faith that is able to endure and withstand struggles, that is the kind of faith I aspire to have. And I'm so grateful and glad that I had this opportunity to go to youth conference this year because it is this much needed reminder that we can come back to our gracious God when we fail again and again and when we fall short and when we are weak that creates hope and joy all over again. The next hymn I have chosen for this morning sings, Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. And this morning, I want to respond with joy for this wonderful hope that we can have in God. So would you please join me in singing our next hymn this morning. Good morning, everyone. And as Melanie mentioned, my name is Tamara, and I'm 19 years old. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Bethany is our mother church in Singapore. And our motto that first came from Bethany was God's kind of church where God is touching lives and people care for people. During the past week at, that we all spent at camp, I not only uh, witnessed both these things happening, but personally experienced it too. The theme of the camp that both the girls have mentioned is the same spirit of faith. And part of this faith is having a spirit of love. The week that I was at camp, I experienced this kind of love, a love where people care for people. Now, aunties and uncles who didn't, didn't even know who I was would still constantly check that I'm adjusting okay, that the aircon's not too cold, or I have eaten enough food for the day. And there was never a day that someone hadn't shown me a sincere gesture of love. And it went beyond making sure that I'm merely okay, but special considerations were made to meet my needs. And aunties and uncles who are cooking for over 150, I think it was about 194 campers, would cook especially without using nuts. So I don't have an allergic reaction. And if there was traces of nuts in anything, you know, they would have told me before I had even touched it. And with some of my joint issues, uh, the camp commandant let me know that I can use the lift if needed, which was out of bounds during camp times. So instead of hiking up the 10 sets of stairs to get the drink bottle I forgot, you know, student pastor Ben Chong welcomes me to use the lift if I need it. And as overwhelmed and touched that I am with all the care shown, you know, I even felt a little strange or embarrassed because I didn't even know all of their names and yet they still cared for me like they do with all the other young people in Bethany. As I return home, I'm probably a few kilos heavier from the five meals a day they gave, and I have a heavier suitcase from some shopping, but the utmost, the utmost important thing that I take back with me is the truths and the lessons that I've learned and the love that I've experienced because of this common faith in God. Bethany has shown me such love, and so how much more God's love extended to me, Joanne, Mel, and to all of you through Christmas. You know, we heard from Melanie about a faith that can transform lives from a thief to someone who would run an orphanage and care for people. And we heard from Joanne about a faith that enables us to cope with life's struggles and even failures. And for myself, I've seen that this faith causes people to care for people. You might ask, like, how? How does faith in God cause someone to show love to others, even strangers? And it's because they themselves have been loved by God through such a great gift of salvation, and in response, they want to show love to all those they encounter. This morning, I want to invite everyone to worship in spirit and in truth, as it says to in John 4, verse 24. 
my response is to rejoice in his truths, that God loves us as his children. In Romans 5 verse 8, it reads, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This was a verse shared during one of the chairing uh, sessions at camp, and I greatly rejoice in this truth. You know, for a kind-hearted person, someone might dare to die for them. But how about for someone who you know is cruel and unkind? Who would die for them? Would you? And this is the kind of love that God shows us. You know, even though we are sinful and we are wicked, Christ died for us. As I anticipate Christmas, which is celebrating the birth of Christ, I really stand in awe of God's love, an unmeasurable, unfathomable love that goes beyond just providing the physical food and physical shelter, but offers spiritual food and an eternal life and home with him. And this is all possible because Christ is to be born, to die for our sins. So this morning, I want to invite you all to find Christmas to be a personal celebration, a time of thanksgiving for yourself as well. The next song repeats in the chorus, man will live forevermore because of Christmas day. And this is a truth that I greatly rejoice in this morning as I come to worship God. And with that, I would like to take our next song, Standing Up, uh, Mary's Boy Child in the VIP number 760. Okay, good, thanks girls. I, I'm glad what they've learned. Um, yeah, I was there at the youth conference, part of the team that was ministering to the teens. You have no idea how much we pray for them. Your parents pray for them. That's what pastors are for. We pray alongside. There's something we can't do that only God can. Okay, and, and we are just, we thank God that they, each one of them have found a very special aspect of faith. Did you listen carefully to what they said? Okay, if you listen, this is what they have found. <clears throat> One, a faith that changes life. Two, a faith that enables us to cope with the problems in life. Three, a faith that genuinely cares for people. And when I was a teen, that's what I sought. I did not come from a Christian family. That was not my privilege. But when I came searching for faith, I asked myself three things. Can this faith change my life? If it cannot, wrong faith. This is not my kind. It has to be something that would really change the life that I am currently living that I am not very, very pleased with. Two, can it really help me to cope? So much of life is filled with challenges. Can it really help me co to cope with problems that can come? And three, Will it create, if this, is this for real? We can genuinely care for people. No strings attached. This was the faith that I really treasured. So I'm really happy that they have come to caught glimpses of and say, this is what we have learned. Okay, Where, how, does, how, do we come, how do we come to faith? And so what they said, we had learned many, many lessons the Word of God, this is why we read the Scriptures. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God. That's how it comes. When we literally open heart, our heart and our mind, and I'm going to listen to what is going to be said, what's going to be read in the Scriptures, and I'm going to listen to it. And if you do that this morning, you know what? Perhaps you would find that faith to be special for you too. Okay, and that's, that's very, very much uh, a hope and a prayer uh, for, for all of us. Okay, well, let's take time to pray together for a very short while, and then we take up this morning's word. <clears throat> let's pray. Now, Father, we pray this morning that you would help us to discover this faith that we hear so much about. Uh, we pray that it would really be something that could be applied, understood, and to see it touching, changing our life in a special, wonderful way too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, when we talk about faith, 
<clears throat> we, of course, talk about faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we celebrate Christmas, it's not the same old thing, right? Because if you've celebrated many Christmas, it can become like the same old thing. What is it? Sales, buying things, shopping, headaches. After a while, people try new things to try and make Christmas a bit more special. And so this year, I discovered something really special. That we have turkeys. You heard of turkeys, right? Turkey, you have a Christmas ham, you have a Christmas turkey. This year, Auntie Mary cooked a very special turkey. What is, the, what is it called again? Good lady. Huh? It was called, it's called a tadakan. Have you ever heard of a tadakan? It is a cross between a duck, a chicken, and a turkey. You've got to be kidding, right? Now, I'm not talking about hybrids. It is, you can buy this at the shop, apparently. Well, of course, we ate it. It is stuffy, it, it is part chicken, part turkey, and part duck. Wow. What did it taste like? Tadakan. <laughs> Try it for yourself. You know, but after you've eaten one too many tadakans, what else is new? Will eating tadakan help me with my faith? The answer is no. It may require you to do more exercise. Right? And so every Christmas, we look at this whole idea of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What else can I discover about him? And when we do, watch that revival, renewal of faith. Okay? Well, we're going to take a look at this Bible memory verse. And we have been looking at what we call the Messianic Psalms, which gives to us a revelation, prophecy of the person of Christ. And so when we celebrate Christmas, we do not just celebrate the birth, but we celebrate the person, we celebrate the significance, we celebrate faith, we celebrate so much more than we actually uh, realize. Okay? So this is very, very important. Okay? Well, somebody said, how come you all celebrate Christmas? Is it biblical? Right? Where does it say in the Bible, Jesus was born on the 25th of December? Of course, it is not written in the Bible, Jesus was born on 25th. In fact, nobody knows. Just because it is not written doesn't mean we don't celebrate. You see, the significance is the person. It's who Christ is that we have come to know, appreciate, believe in, and affected our life. That's why we celebrate. Okay? You mustn't think when we celebrate the Queen's birthday, it lands on the actual day. If it does, she's about more than 200, 300 years old. Because every state celebrates a birthday different day. Right? For obvious reasons. So when we gather on the 25th of December, we celebrate with joy. Don't let anyone tell you you cannot celebrate Christmas on 25th because it is not written in the Bible. The Bible was not written for that reason. The Bible was written for wonderful reasons and purpose that we may discover the Lord Jesus. Okay? Now, this is a, a, a wonderful but dif difficult text. Very difficult text. Well, tell, let's take a look at it. Psalm 110. And this is one part of the Lord Jesus Christ that is perhaps uh, we may not be too familiar with, but important, okay? Very, very important. Now, let's take a look at this. In Psalm 110, verse 4, well, this is our Bible memory verse. Well, let's take a look at it. Okay, let's read this together. And it reads, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Psalm 110 was written um, by David. Does this apply to David? The answer is, of course not. He was not a priest. He's king, yes. 
right? But he was not a priest. So who does it apply to? And we uh, look at this as it applies to the Messiah. But how is this messianic? It's difficult to understand because we don't really understand priesthood. Right? It's hard because we don't have a physical priesthood today of this kind. We're not talking Roman Catholic priesthood, okay? It's a different thing. We're talking about this priesthood we look at in the scriptures. We just don't have the physical priesthood today. And so it's difficult. What is the priesthood for? God was the one who ordained it, right? Way back in the days of Moses. What is the priest? The priest play a very, very important role in the life, faith, and community of the Jewish people. By the way, to this day, okay? Over in Israel, there are people who actually are now being trained to be priests because there's a prophecy that the temple will be restored. You see, the priesthood is connected with temple ministry. We don't have a physical priesthood because there's no physical temple over in Israel today. But right now, there are actually people being trained. And to be a priest, you have to descend from the line of the Levites, of Aaron. They call the priest in Hebrew, Kohen. Okay, so if you have any friends that are Jews, and if their name is Kohen, they could be from that tribe. You, you, you're familiar with the name Kohen? There's one famous guy, Leonard Kohen, who wrote the song, Hallelujah. Heard of it before? Shrek? See, you know Shrek. Who is that? Do you know this guy who wrote that song in the 1980s is actually from this tribe, priestly tribe? Not that he was a priest. He was a singer. He was Bob Dylan's friend. Only Bob Dylan appreciated his song, Hallelujah, by the way. It was only made famous because of Shrek, the ogre. But did you know this is, you see, today they are calling those who are of the family of Kohen, come, be trained as priests. We are preparing for the temple to be restored. They are actually doing that today. So to be a priest of God, you actually have to descend from. Now, this is where it's just really challenging. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. What is a priest for anyway? Okay? And, and it's hard to understand it. One, this is, this is what, what God stated, established. Now, I'm one of those few people who actually read the, and studied the book of Leviticus. Anyone have done that? I actually did. Word, word for word, every word, every phrase. And that's the priesthood. Let me summarize it for you so you, spare you the pain. Right? The priest is appointed for, number one, he stands before God. Two, he teaches people about God. He leads three people to worship God. Four, he is a messenger of God. And that was what God established for the people of God. Now, that is very, very special. Right? And it plays a significant role in the life of the people. Far more than we realize. Okay, now here is an interesting story. Okay, now this is a story. Nobody knows whether it is true or not. Okay. Now in f centuries ago, where the Pope had significant powers, the, the Pope today don't have such powers. But the Pope of the past did. And he declared a decree that all the Jews had either convert to Roman Catholic or leave Italy. Wow, that was tough. There was an outcry in the Jewish community. 
Okay, now, this is a little bit interesting story. Okay, now, nobody knows whether it's true or not. And so the Pope, okay, offered them a deal, the Jewish community that was in Italy, and said to them, okay, we will enter into a religious debate. If your Jewish priest, no, rabbi, because no temple, they had rabbis, can beat me in a debate, theological debate, you can stay. So depends on the leader, you know, depends on the spiritual guide, depends on the teacher, right? But if you lose, you leave Italy. Except, and so the people had no choice. They say, okay. And so the Jewish community picked one of their most wisest teacher, rabbi, and to represent them. Problem. Pope, Pope speaks what language? Ah, Italian. They don't speak Italian. These rabbi don't speak Italian. They only speak Yiddish. So how are they going to debate with, with they're going to speak the same language? So, okay, this will be a silent debate. Ah, silent debate. Okay, let's, let's go for it. Okay, so the day was chosen and they were all there. They sat opposite each other, looked at each other for a full minute. The Pope started. He raised his hand and showed three fingers. And so the rabbi looked at him and, uh, okay, you, three fingers, <clears throat> fine. And he raised up one finger. And so he looked at him. And he, you, the Pope used this finger and waved the finger around his head. And so the rabbi pointed to the ground. No words, okay? Right? The Pope brought out the wafer and the wine. Right? The communion that they have. Okay? And then, the rabbi took out an apple. The Pope was so upset. He walked off and declared the Jews have won this debate. And so he went back. So they went back and, 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 and the cardinals asked him, how were you beaten? And so he listened to his explanation. Okay? And so he, he said, first I held up three fingers to represent the Trinity, right? And so the rabbi held up one finger to, to say, there is, yes, three, three, the Trinity, but there's only one God in our faith. So he won, okay? And so I waved my finger to show him that God is all around us. And he responded by pointing to the ground that God is right here with us. And so he won again. And so I pulled out the wine and the wafer to show that God has absolved us of all our sins. And finally, he pulled up the apple to remind me of original sin. And so I was beaten. I cannot continue. And so the rabbi went back to his Jewish community and they asked him, how did you beat him? No words and you beat him. And he said, I don't know. Right? He said, the Pope showed me three fingers to tell me that in three days you leave Italy. And so I show him one finger and said, not a single one of us is going to leave this place. And he said, you know what? They tell me the whole country, he one finger, whole, waving around, the whole country will be cleared of the Jews. And I told him, nope, I'm staying right here. And then what happened? He took out his lunch and I took out mine. <laughs> I don't think it's a true story. <laughs> you know, you do, they don't understand each other. Right? And so sometimes when we don't understand it, what, what on earth is this? What has it got to? We, we, it leaves us just guessing. Okay? What on earth is this? priesthood according to Melchizedek. Okay, now, we need to turn to the New Testament to help us understand this 
And then that we may have some understanding. Otherwise, we don't know what on earth uh, you know, he's talking about. Okay, now let's take a look at this very quickly, which is useful. It's very, very specific. And the Hebrew author applies this to, look at this, in chapter 4. Okay, we read chapter 4 and verse 14. How does Christ being the priest got to, how does that, what has it got to do with us? How does that apply to us? Okay, now, take a look at this very, very carefully. Right? Now, in chapter 4, we read in verse 14, we read this wonderful text. Okay? Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. There we go. This is a great high priest. He is Jesus, the Son of God. He has passed through the heavens, and then he says, let us hold fast our confession, our confession of faith. So our confession of faith includes believing that Jesus is that great high priest. Okay? Now, in verse 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. I think we all can understand that. That we struggle with our weaknesses in practicing our faith, in living each day. I think we can understand this. How come? What does Jesus do as high priest? You know what he does? The first thing he does, he identifies with us. Take a look at this. He sympathize, in other words, he can identify with our weaknesses. He was at all point tempted as we were, yet without sin. Now, there's his difference. He identifies, there is identification. So when we look at Jesus as son of God, son of man, he came into the world. One of the reasons is he can connect with us. He identifies with us. He identifies with our weaknesses. He, when we talk weaknesses, we talk about human weaknesses. We talk about struggle. Jesus was born not to the well-to-do family. He struggled. He struggled. He, the, he had to live. He had to make a living. He had to do whatever it does, takes, to support the family when the father passed away. Can Christ identify Yes, the person who is best able to help and he represents God is a person that identifies with you. And that is very, very special. Now, two, we take a look at Hebrews chapter 5 and then verse 5. What else Christ as high priest? And we read, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. And he was, okay, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Right? That phrase we read in Psalm 2 takes on another part now, significance, that God made Christ priest. Okay? And we read, this is uh, Psalm 110.4, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That's your office. That's your role. How did Jesus go about fulfilling that role? Watch this, verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries. Wow. You see, one of the roles of the priest is he prays for the people. And how did he pray? He offered prayers and supplication with tears, believing God was able to save even from death. And he was heard because of his godly fear. God heard his prayers because of his godly fear. Right? 
Now, we read in verse 8, though he was son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. To me, that's called inspiration. He was that inspiration that look how he was son, and yet he obeyed God to fulfill the role of a high priest, which is not easy. You bear the anguish of the problems of other people, the pain of other people, and you bring it to God in prayer. Now, I can have a little glimpse of that when you pray for people, when people ask you, could you please pray for my children? Can you please pray for my loved one? How do you pray? You cannot just say words. The soul is in agony. You feel with the person. Tears come. You, even if you go through suffering, you obey the Lord. That is inspiration. That is absolute inspiration. Not only did Jesus identify, this is how we can relate with him, identification. Did he go through it? Yes. Two, look how he went through it. He succeeded. God heard his prayers. God heard him. Because of his godly fear. Because of his obedience. Even though when he is son, he learned obedience. Obedience is learned. You don't, you're not naturally obedient. So when we don't teach our children obedience, they will not grow up obedient. They will grow up rebelling. When they are small, they are rebellious. Wait till they become big. You don't have the strength to control them. And they can rebel, not maybe not physically, not violently, far from it. But they can rebel in the decision they make in life. They will go against everything you have taught them. Is that possible? That's painful. And that is, it could be very, very real. And so when we see the example here of how he son and he learned obedience, how can I relate with this high priest in Jesus? I am inspired by his example. One, he identifies with me. And I, who am I that Jesus would identify with me? I'm a nobody. I'm sinful. And yet he's not ashamed to call me brethren. He wants to be high priest to me. That I am glad. Two, what an inspiration. Now, here's the third thing. Okay? Now, this is, this is the third part of it which is challenging. In verse 10, Called by God as high priest. He didn't call himself. God called him. He fulfilled this according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a historical figure in the book of Genesis chapter 14. When Abraham went to war, not because he wanted to, but because his nephew was part of the war spoils, Four kings destroyed the country he was living in, Sodom and Gomorrah, raided the place, took Lot. And so when the uncle heard this, he, he brave, mustered up 318 men and pursued the four kings and defeated them. Now, he did this when he was about 80 years old, okay? How on earth is that possible? All odds against you. Age is against you. You are old. Don't try to start any war when you're old. Right? That's why older people are just very, anything goes okay. When you're young and you're newly married, yeah, you want to argue with the wife. You know, I'm right. Watch when the person get older. Okay, 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 okay. You, okay just, yeah. The fighting spirit is gone. Just peace on earth, goodwill to men. How does a person who is that much older able to battle and win? And here comes a person called Melchizedek and tells him, Abraham of God Most High, can I tell you something? God delivered you. And Abraham agrees, yes, 
I lift my hand up to God most high. You know, there are battles to be fought. You want to save your loved one, and, you know, it's impossible. You don't have the resources. How did you do it? Is there a person who actually prayed for you? Yes, this person called Melchizedek. He is called Melchizedek. Not really interesting, because the word Melchizedek literally means king of righteousness. King of Salem, king of peace. So who was he? Not much is known, except he's the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Guess who Christ is? He is the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Peace. Why? How come you succeeded? How come you were able to overcome? There is a great high priest praying for you, and the word is intercession. And so when we celebrate Christmas, mind you, I celebrate with great thanksgiving that I have Jesus Christ, who is my great high priest, who identifies with our weaknesses, who helps me, who is such an inspiration to me, who is there praying for me. Now just talk about pray, prayer, praying for people. Last week, until Lillian uh, called me and said, Chris, I'm going in for surgery. The eye problem, it is, the eye pressure is so high. And I don't want to operate. And I said, look, consider, if you have the provisions, go for it. But it's risky. You can come out blind. That's what the doctors will tell you. Please sign here. If you go blind, operation successful, you fail. Anything can go wrong. And that's tough. Did I pray? Of course. Here is a friend. Here is a church member. Here is a person who I've come to love and appreciate as a friend. And so I wrote to Pastor Charlie. And I said, Pastor, uh, Auntie Lillian's going in for surgery. And he said, please tell her I'm praying for her too. Oh, we believe in prayers. And so she said, Chris, I'll update you after surgery. I'm glad for her faith. She said, no matter what, I'm going to just trust in the Lord. I'm going in. And so this morning, she tells us, my pressure of my eye, as it went up to as high as what, seven, 60, 70. You, well, you could go blind. It is now seven. The doctor is amazed. He says, I have not seen this before. I've not seen such recovery. I've not seen, out of so many patients, I've been a doctor for a long time. Do you believe in prayer? I do. It is not my prayer that is effective. It is a prayer of one who is high priest. We have a great high priest that has got to the heavens, who ever lives to intercede for us. Take a look at this text, okay? I want to share with you this text, and then we will close in prayer together. How wonderful this word is. How Jesus is that great high priest. Let's take a look at this. Chapter 7. And verse 25 as our last word, last text. And you think about this. Okay? And it reads, Therefore, he is also a reference to Christ as the high priest able to save to the uttermost. The word save is the word deliver you. Can the Lord deliver you? The word is yes. He can save to the uttermost to those who come to God through Him. How, now watch this very carefully. How does it work? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now how absolutely comforting, stirring it is to know that the Lord Jesus Christ ever lives, right hand of God, interceding, praying for us. To those who will come to God in faith, who will come to God through Jesus believing 
he will be there to help us in our weaknesses. He will be there to deliver us, save to the uttermost. And I am just grateful to God that when Auntie Lillian wrote and she said, I have been delivered. We cannot but thank God, right? And we pray for full recovery. This is just a glimpse of what God can do. Can God deliver you? We have a great high priest. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. Would you come to him? Would you come to God through him? Would you believe that he is there for you? Three things. He identifies with you. He also went through human weakness. He also struggled, but without sin. He has to be without sin to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Two, can he inspire us to live for the Lord? And three, how can, how can we do that? He ever lives to intercede for us. This is how I celebrate Christmas with much thanksgiving. And so when I celebrate, I don't just celebrate the birth, which we will on Christmas Day, but I celebrate who Jesus is to me. My king, my high priest, who ever lives to intercede for us. May this word bring much encouragement to whatever you're going through. Don't lose heart, don't lose hope. Pray. When you, some people say to be the best, you know, I, can't, I cannot but pray. You know how true that is? If you don't pray, there's nothing else there. The best thing to do is to pray. There is a high priest praying alongside, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? May we celebrate Christmas with great hope and thanksgiving and much assurance in our faith in him. Keep praying for our children. Keep praying for our loved ones. Keep praying about our circumstances, whatever they are. Our great high priest is there, ever standing there to intercede for us. King of righteousness, king of peace. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for every prayer that is answered. And it just assures us that we truly have a great high priest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it becomes even more obvious when we struggle and we have no solution. And then our heart is just so disturbed we have no peace. And when you answer, we know that this is an answer from you. And so we pray that this word would create faith in our hearts this morning to know Jesus as our high priest, to come to him for salvation, to come to him, to relate with him, to be inspired by his life as well, to serve you with great courage and strength this Christmas season. We ask that you would bless us as we give an offering this morning and as we give recognizing that it is through Jesus that bring all our gifts to you. And we ask for your cleansing, that this gift may be acceptable. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's pray, uh, prepare an offering this morning for the Lord's work. And Abraham, the story of Melchizedek. Go and read Genesis 14 by yourself. Not a bit, very long passage, short passage, to see how Abraham worshipped God. There was Melchizedek. That's what the priest does. He leads, leads people to worship. That God teaches. God was the one who gave you this victory. You would not have done this yourself, obviously. 
and he spontaneously gave an offering, a tithe, one-tenth of all that he had. See, that is our response of worship. The tithing is not a law. It is not, you must give or else. Of course not. It is out of gratitude, out of thanksgiving, out of understanding that truly God has blessed us. And God blessed Abraham. God Most High has blessed you. Blessed be you. And God has indeed blessed you. And the greatest blessing of all is not the material things that we own. And the greatest blessing of all is found in this person called the Lord Jesus Christ. One small child in a land of a thousand. One small dream. Take a look at this. 164. We sing this Christmas carol. It's found in the person of Christ. It's every spiritual blessing is found in him. And when we can find faith in the Lord Jesus, watch your heart, your mind, your spirit, find at a renewal of hope and strength in the most wonderful way. Okay? And, and this is really, really special. Okay? Well, let's sing this together as our closing carol, One Small Child. That God gave, that fulfilled the prophecy to be Savior and King and High Priest. Let's sing of our Savior with much gladness and adoration to Him this morning. Let's sing this together. Let's pray together. Let's ask God to bless us as we go from here this morning. And now may this great God of ours, who has given to us the Lord Jesus Christ, to be King, to be High Priest to us, Whoever lives to intercede through him and all who go through him, he is able to save to the uttermost. Give to us that grace and strength to hold firm to our faith, to pray, to not lose heart, but to believe. May the Spirit of God enable us, enlighten us to see Jesus afresh this Christmas, to see beyond the child, to see him as our high priest forever, which we love and adore until he returns for us one day to receive us in glory. Until that day, we wait with faith and hope. And we ask this in his son's name.